Sierra Club. We're really happy that you could be here today. Um, we actually have some chocolates coming around. Ken, why don't you share some chocolates up here with uh, our legislative friends? Okay. All right. Okay. And um, uh, again, I'm Glenn Messa with the Sierra Club. We're happy to be here today. The Sierra Club in Virginia has declared uh, this week as Chocolate Lovers for Climate Protection. And coincidentally, in the New York Times today, there was an article that's, that, that mentioned the fact that chocolate prices were rising, uh, in part because of the demand, because we all love chocolate, and also because of bad weather. Specifically, um, the weather phenomenon, one I'd never heard of, called the Harmata, Harmata, which is a dry, dusty wind that sweeps across the major cocoa areas in West Africa, where most of our chocolate comes from. Um, no less than Mars, the Candy Mars, which has ties here in Virginia, Kevin Rabinovich, who is uh, the director of global sustainability for Mars and a major buyer of chocolate, said, we, and this was in the, the, the Guardian newspaper in April of last year, we see crops suffering from climate change and that flows to us in terms of price. So obviously, um, when you talk about food prices, uh, chocolate may be a luxury for a lot of us, but as a practical matter, uh, we have to eat other food as well. And climate disruption is impacting food in many ways. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of other things in our lives. And, and so we wanted to not make light of it, but kind of um, uh, give people a sense of how climate change touches us in a variety of ways. And one of those is the price of chocolate. We're pleased today to actually have um, Kelly Walker with uh, Chocolates by Kelly. She's going to talk briefly about uh, the chocolate business and, uh, and specifically about uh, some of the issues that, that concern us. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, I hope that you've all enjoyed the chocolates that we've passed around, so now I'm not the only one that ate chocolate for breakfast. We're all together now. <laughs> um, so to tell you a little bit about what I do, I, I can make uh, gourmet chocolates. I've been doing it for about 20 years, family history of it. Uh, and we put a lot of love and pride into what we do. Um, and the way that, that climate change and higher prices has affect us, uh, affected us on the ground level, um, and that's, it's pretty substantial. We've, I've seen a 45% increase in chocolate prices in the last two years. Uh, that's big. It's really big. And, and there are a few small businesses out there that can handle that kind of cost increase. Um, and, you know, if it's higher demand, I say bring it on. You know, we'll just get faster. We'll get better at it. But the climate change thing is a concern. Um, I want to bring up the Dust Bowl, if any of you remember, uh, was part of American history uh, called the Dirty Thirties. Um, this was a man-made disaster uh, where agricultural products could not survive, and eventually a lot of humans couldn't survive in that. Uh, we are able to affect uh, our environment around us, and we need to be aware of what we can do. Um, so for better or worse, we are big enough to affect aware of that, look it up and see uh, maybe what we're doing that's wrong and what we can do to fix it. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Well, thank you for those chocolates. <laughs> appreciate that. Very good. All right. Uh, we have a place to have with us uh, Senator Mullen, who's going to offer some brief remarks. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Thank you. Thank you I don't know about you, but chocolate is one of my favorite foods. Um, some people might even say I like it too much. But um, the point here today is is that chocolate comes from cocoa beans, and cocoa beans are really at risk because we simply have not taken charge of our responsibility to improve uh, the environment. I do sit on the Governor's Climate Change Commission, and that commission is going to be developing recommendations, I uh, hope both broad-ranging that are policy-oriented and, and, policy and some that are individually oriented, so we can really um, start turning things around. I, I just want to note, and some of you may have read a New York Times article that was uh, published today online. It talks about Valentine's Day chocolate will cost more this year because cocoa is rising. And, uh, and one of the reasons, again, is because the climate is changing. Um, farmers will begin to see declines in cocoa production by 2030. And also suitable regions, that would be regions located within 300 uh, kilometers of the Ghana or Ivy Coast, will also see considerable shrinkage in their ability to produce cocoa beans. 
So what this means is some of the things we love, we're going to have to pay a lot more attention to the environment, which we should begin to love a lot more. So on the upcoming Valentine's Day, I just ask that we all show not just love for our family, friends, uh, significant others, spouses, but we also show love for the world in which we live. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Let me um, introduce uh, our other guest here, too, and then we're going to have uh, some other remarks as well. But uh, thank you, Senator Morrison, for joining us as well. Okay, and Senator Delegate Sam Rasul, Delegate Rick Sullivan, and Delegate Lopez is going to be next. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, as many of you might have saw uh, a couple weeks ago, I got into it with my friends on the Republican side of the aisle regarding climate change and whether or not it really exists. Um, and I had a, a fun time sort of talking to some of my friends about the science behind it. And they said, well, the science is uncertain. And I quoted in my, uh, my speech, <laughs> climate change evidence and causes from the US National Academy of Sciences and a joint study with the National Academy of Science in the United Kingdom, the Royal Society. And they jointly confirmed that one, scientists know that climate change is largely caused by human activities. Two, human activities have significantly dis disturbed the natural carbon cycle by extracting long buried fossil fuels and burning them for energy. And three, global warming of just a few degrees will have a serious impacts on human societies and the natural world. I made it clear during my speech that I stand with the Royal Academy and the National Academy of Science and not the 3% or so of scientists who are paid and bought for, uh, paid and paid for by the, uh, the auto industry and the oil and gas industry. Um, you know, these guys, every time we talk about taking a step forward to protect the environment, they claim the sky is falling. And every single time they've been wrong. Whether it's a Clean Air Act, whether it's <laughs> acid rain, they would say well, business is going to go out of we're going to have no businesses. We're going to, the lights will go out. It'll be a huge impact on the economy. And every single time they've been wrong. What the EPA is doing right now with the Clean Power Plan is attainable with just a little bit of work. The plan sets out flexible, achievable approaches to carbon pollution reductions. And the CPP gives Virginia the flexibility to design its own implementation plan for meeting its targets. The sensible approach that the EPA has given us gives Virginia the autonomy to determine how to achieve its carbon reduction target in a way that promotes job creation and helps build economic opportunities in Virginia. Keep in mind that Virginia's neighboring states are already doubling down on solar and clean energy options. With the right policies in place, Virginia also has the potential to create thousands of jobs and tens of millions in economic development, jobs that currently go to North Carolina which has far outpaced us when it comes to solar energy, to West Virginia, who is a state that is far outpaced us regarding uh, wind energy, and to Maryland, whose energy efficiency industry is about to save them a whopping 15% on their energy consumption issues. The protection and preservation of Virginia's environment is included in Virginia's constitution and should not be a partisan issue. If we have the chance to create more jobs, increase economic development, lower monthly power bills, improve public health, especially for vulnerable populations, save the chocolate industry, and create a cleaner and healthier environment for future generations, why wouldn't we act immediately? It makes no sense. Save the chocolate. Thank you. Next we're going to hear from Delegate uh, Sam Rasul of uh, Rona. I have three children at home that will ensure that no matter what the price of chocolate is, the industry will always be in business, but certainly we'd love for it to be reasonably priced. I like to take the business approach to it. You know, oftentimes with a lot of progressive issues, we think that logic and reason can win the day. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. It's our messaging and the way we speak to rule in other parts of Virginia I think is very important. Being from Southwest Virginia, that's important for me. Um, you know, we have a, a great opportunity to talk about the jobs that are created. Delia Lopez touched on the neighboring states. Our neighboring states have actually created over 300,000 jobs that are green jobs, clean energy jobs. And those are really uh, pocketbook issues that I think uh, are important that really resonate with people. I mean, I can't believe I'm reading this. Georgia is becoming a national leader in solar energy. 
Texas has seen wind power boom under Governor Rick Perry. <clears throat> North Carolina has 650 megawatts of solar, and we have 15 megawatts of solar. That's actually why, when I read that the first time, uh, about nine months ago, about North Carolina, that's when I had the idea to put in HB 1297, a piece of legislation that allows for localities to give a tax break on the M&T tax for businesses that actually invest in renewable energy. I couldn't believe North Carolina literally is uh, 100 times better at renewable energy than we are. And the reason why is because of the, the tax incentives that they have. So instead of just sitting in a silo and complaining about being right and why they're wrong, here we take a more right-leaning idea of a tax incentive, like they've mastered in North Carolina, with the left-leaning idea of trying to save our environment. And fortunately, that piece of legislation has moved out of the House into the Senate. But in addition to that, uh, we can talk about how clean energy um, has an enormous upside uh, with the environment. Um, we, particularly in Southwest Virginia, are seeing uh, growth in, in asthma uh, and other particulates uh, that are impacting the health of uh, younger children especially. So I think if we frame this correctly, frame this argument well, the message well, uh, then we can show the people, especially the people in Southwest Virginia, this can be a win-win for everyone. Thank you, Delegate. And we'd like to hear now from uh, Delegate Rip Sullivan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Glenn. I was, uh, I was really proud of myself yesterday <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> rather than what I typically do, which is wait till the morning of February 14th to remember that it's Valentine's Day, <laughs> I, uh, I got on the phone with 1-800-Flowers yesterday to order my lovely wife, Beth, flowers for Saturday. And I ordered a beautiful bouquet, and then the woman on the other end of the line said, and would you like some chocolate with that, Mr. Sullivan? And then she quoted me a price. And a cheapskate that I am, I said, no, I couldn't handle that price for that chocolate. But it did get me thinking about this, and I realized I had this event coming on today, uh, and I thought it was uh, appropriate that I should be buying or not buying chocolate uh, for Valentine's Day as a result of what seemed to me to be rising prices. Yeah, it's, Alfonso was talking about the certainty of climate change, uh, and another thing that's certain with climate change coming uh, is that this is going to affect the ability to grow crops, raise livestock, catch fish uh, for, uh, off into the future. Uh, we're not going to be able to do it in the ways we've done it in the past. Droughts, floods, other uh, uh, weather events really are going to pose very serious challenges to farmers, uh, ranchers, and impact crop yields uh, off into the future. The effect of these sorts of things internationally is going to be even worse because while here in the United States we have uh, we may have some resources relating to uh, crop management and ranching practices. That's going to be more limited uh, in the third world, where, as we all know, much of our food supply come from, comes from. The global food supply uh, has got to uh, concern all of us here in the United States. And when you get to chocolate, uh, I was surprised to learn that 70% of the global cocoa production comes from West African countries. So with climate change affecting ability to grow everything, including chocolate in West Africa, uh, we have to be concerned as chocolate lovers uh, about climate change. So there's a specific reason to be concerned about climate change in addition to all you've heard about uh, climate change more, more, uh, more globally. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a chocolate lover, so I'm happy to be part of the uh, uh, chocolate lovers uh, against climate change. Uh, and I appreciate the invitation to be here. I, too, have put in some legislation relating to, to uh, climate issues. Uh, it had, how to say this, limited success this year. Um, but uh, ever the optimist, I'll be back next year. We're going to make more progress next year. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank Delegate Simon for coming. Thank you so much, Delegate. Right. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce um, Kate Adelson. Uh, who's going to make some remarks for the Sierra Club relative to uh, this issue, and uh, then we'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will be brief, um, and, and just want to thank again all of our um, uh, elected officials who are here today. Um, this is such a critical and urgent issue, and we could not be more proud to have such great leadership uh, among the crowd that's here in this room this morning. Um, I, uh, echoing some of the concerns and uh, thoughts of some of our leaders, 
um, from the Virginia Sierra Club and many of the um, citizens from across the state that we work with every day um, here in Virginia um, who are very excited to take this opportunity to remind our elected officials, um, many who are not in this room in particular, um, that chocolate is just one example of the many reasons that climate change is becoming more and more of an urgent issue um, for our families and our communities. Um, what better day um, than Valentine's Day to remind folks um, that it's important to take action on the issues that we care about, and certainly climate is one of those um, for a, an increasing number of Americans. The rising cost of chocolate resulting from production issues associated with climate factors is a wake-up call for all of us who love chocolate. And if the chocolate lovers across the state of Virginia um, will take a moment this week uh, to take action and contact their public officials to let them know that they are demanding action on climate change, um, we might actually get even more meaningful action uh, to address carbon pollution and hopefully more of that support um, that some of our elected officials this morning have spoken of. Virginians may see the impacts of climate disruption on chocolate in the price of a candy bar, but the greater harm, um, has again, has been alluded to earlier, um, really is borne by the small farmers and agricultural work workers in many developing countries around the world. And these regions of the world are ones in which cocoa is produced and include many developing nations with limited capacity to adapt and absorb the costly consequences of climate disruption. So this is not a trivial matter. This is a very important issue, and we are just taking the opportunity today around this um, you know, widely um, uh, celebrated American holiday um, to recognize it. In addition, Governor McAuliffe will be implementing the EPA's Clean Power Plan in Virginia, and Senators Kane and Warner at the federal level are critical in defending these climate protections against attacks in Congress. So this is a, a lighthearted way to remind them um, of the urgency of this issue and know that their bold leadership is really needed in pursuing a transition to clean energy um, and climate protection for the Commonwealth.